There is a very confusing visual image of the fundamental unit that you need to appreciate what gauge symmetry is all about. When you take the totality of all of those circles together, one for each point on the surface of the sphere, they create something called a three-sphere, that is all the points that are one unit of distance away from the origin in four-dimensional space. So that three-dimensional sphere is the analog of a two-dimensional sphere sitting in three-dimensional space. But if, let's bring up the Escher staircase. And Jamie has a nice wrinkle on this that instead of using MC Escher's staircase, he's got this animated guy who just keeps going down. Hmm. All right. Now what's going on with those stairs? Now those stairs are sort of an optical illusion because obviously it can't just keep going down. But then you build these systems like rock, paper, scissors. What's the best thing to throw in rock, paper, scissors? Well, it depends on what you throw. Well, but we should be able to agree that rock is better than scissors. Rock is better than scissors, scissors but paper is better than rock. Right, so you go around that thing and now the, the point is that you get to like, rock is much better than rock, right? And you, yes. that, that seems crazy. Now that Seems concept crazy. would be what we would call holonomy. The weird sentence, rock is better than rock because of that going but around why, the loop. Why rock is better than rock? I don't get it. Like well, rock, rock is, better is better than, than scissors. scissors. Scissors is better than paper. Right. Paper is better than rock. So right. by transitivity, rock is therefore better than rock because you went around the loop and came back to rock. Okay. Turn the cup 360 degrees without spilling it and try to take a sip. Okay, that, that didn't work. No. Now, without coming back, <laughs> how would you take a sip? If I got it all the way around that way? Yeah. Mr. Mm. Jiu-Jitsu Man. I would have to... I would have to help myself. Yeah, no, no, you're going to do it. All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay. Are so you going to go around I'm a circle? Do 360. Okay. All right. Now, I'm screwed if I don't bring it back underneath. Oh, I see. So that system required 720 degrees of rotation unexpectedly. Oh, you just keep going. Right. Okay. Now, the idea that there are objects that don't come back to themselves under 360 degrees of rotation, but require 720 is probably something you've never thought about before in your life. Right. But without that, you wouldn't have the Pauli exclusion principle. You wouldn't have the stability of matter. And this thing is called the Philippine wine dance. Jamie, do you want to? So this spinner is one of the coolest, most important objects anywhere. And it was discovered to be important in physics by a guy named Paul Dirac. Right? It's fun. Okay, so this 720 theory is entirely responsible for the world that we live in. This is so bizarre to and watch this in animation. And nobody knows about it. Right? Like, unless you're hanging out with physicists, they don't tell you that electromagnetism has to do with the fact that there's a secret circle at every point in space and time that's invisible to you. They don't tell you that there's stuff that requires 720 degrees of rotation. They just say mind-blowing stuff about... Whoa! So what is happening in the 720 degrees of rotation in the quantum world? There's an object that is requiring this just the way the cup arm system requires 720 degrees of rotation. What object is this? It's called a spinner. And that spinner is how we model the electron, the neutrino, quarks. All that is spinorial matter. Sir. That's a good long pause. I like it. Yeah. And what, where does this fit in in our model of the universe? Like, what is the function of this? Why is it there? What is it? How do we know it's there? Well, we know it's there. Um, because uh, when Dirac, so there was this problem with like the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation takes one derivative in terms of the direction of time and takes two derivatives in the direction of all the spatial directions. But because Einstein told us that space and time are woven together, for the theory to be relativistic, you need the same number of derivatives of time as of space, because space-time is sort of one kind of semi-unified object. All right, that means you either have to boost the number of derivatives of time up to two to match the two t derivatives in the directions of space, or you have to knock the two direct derivatives in the spatial directions down to one derivative 
to get it to be equal. Now, one direction gets you to something called the klein gordon equation. What Dirac did is he took a square root of the klein gordon equation to get these spinners. So he had these numbers. He didn't understand at first that he was going to get kicked into this world of spinners. He came up with a square root equation in which a times b, thought to be numbers, was not equal to b times a. It was like equal to the negative of b times a. So it was like, what two numbers, when, when you multiply them, matter in which order? It wasn't numbers, it was matrices. So this was one of the great insights, you know, rival to Einstein in terms of the depth of what it told us about the universe. Most of us haven't really heard of Paul Dirac. We don't realize that he has one of the three most important equations in physics. Now, in when you say three most important, important in how it's applicable to everyday life, or important in how it's given us an understanding in quantum physics, or important how it's understand it, it's its understanding is, is significant to quantum we're physicists. Talking about our, we're talking about bedrock reality. Like you and I are having a conversation, and if, if you're a Matrix fan, and what we might call the construct. Okay. What is the construct made of? 